Index investing or passive investing has grown more popular with investors. Even Warren Buffett has the benefits of owning an entire index like the S&P 500 over the long term. An example of an index tracking ETF is BMO's S&P 500 Index ETF. It's the largest ETF in Canada that tracks this well-recognized and popular index. It provides exposure to the returns of the market cap weighted S&P 500 Index at a low cost the management fee of just 0.08%. This broad market ETF makes for an efficient building block in a portfolio, saving you time and effort while mitigating single stock risk. If you're looking for exposure to the largest and most liquid public companies in the United States, this ETF delivers an easy to use solution and instant diversification. Commissions and management fees and expenses all may be associated with investments in exchange traded funds. Please read the ETF facts or prospectus of the BMO ETFs before investing. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back or have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour, episode 122. As always, joined by the three Migos. We got uh, Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, 49ers, Super Bowl, Rich Super Diaz, Bowl. PGM. Rich, you're in the Alps. I'm in the Alps. I'm in the, Alps. I'm in the I'm in the uh, small town of Zermatt. Um, it's not Zermatt, it's Zermatt. And uh, that's in Switzerland, my favorite country in the world after Canada. Um, and if you ask me, I'll tell you why, but yeah, I'm here with a, having a ski mini ski vacation. Um, my, my time in Europe is, is slowly dwindling. So I think this is like one of our last jollies. I know it's kind of a reach to go from Montreal to Switzerland to go skiing, but in some ways it's cheaper. In other ways, it's painfully, painfully long, more expensive. How long is that flight? Uh, oh, five and a half hours, but oh, I, I fall bad. asleep. I fall asleep as soon as the plane takes off. <laughs> One of those guys, eh? They wedge yeah. you in the back of the bus next yeah, to the yeah. uh, next to the can. Yeah, I wouldn't ever pay for business flights. It's I just immediately fall asleep. But anyway, how are you doing, Keith? So I went to Zermatt. Is that you? Is that what you pronounce it? Zermatt. 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 I went there <laughs> about twenty years ago, maybe. What people maybe maybe they don't realize if you haven't been there before. It's a uh, a little Swiss village way up in in the Alps, but it's only accessible by this. Uh, what is it a clog crog no it's train? a train it's a train it's really cool and it has like gears yeah. so it can pull up the huge train it's beautiful yeah it's a special name for that kind of a train though I'm, i know i'm screwing it up but up in the town then uh it's only basically electric golf carts zipping yeah, around is. there's no motorized vehicles they're it's sweet just... they're really cool yeah, it's a really fun place to go and the other cool thing with uh zermatt is that the, the toblerone bar was zermatt. actually created for the Matterhorn, you know, which is the famous, you know, mountain there. So Steve is a party pooper and uh, doesn't like my lighting ever. And behind this, you can't see it, obviously, if you're listening to it, but behind this window is the Matterhorn, uh, which is one of the tallest peaks in Europe. Elevation, 4,478 meters. And it was the Toblerone logo until it no longer is. The Toblerone had to swap it out. Did they cancel the Toblerone? They well, it's because it's like no longer Swiss made, because they produce lots of the Toblerones outside of Switzerland, and so they lost their like you know stamp of approval. Zermatt, Eatsy <laughs> Bugs. So if you expensive. want a good trip, go to Burgundy wine area in France, which is like the south southeastern part of the country, and then you zip over there and over to see uh, Zermatt, then you know for a holiday. Yeah. That's your travel. There you go. Travel Looney tips. Hour travel suggestion. Looney Hour yeah. travel tips. Yeah. CA. That's right. It's, it, our new it's a good one. Okay, guys, very quickly, we're not going to dwell on it, but it's a Super Bowl weekend. So, you know, I've worked really hard for this all year and, you know, our team made it. So, Mrs. Ice Cap would be like losing her, her beep on, on Sunday watching this stuff. Anyway, it's a fun. I'll give you my my prediction don't, right don't now. Don't make a prediction. You're gonna jinx it. Every time you make predictions, they lose. No, nah, I'm not a believer in 
jinx and luck and everything. You make you make your own bet. Uh, but I put a lot of thought behind this, and I am picking the 49ers to win. Okay, and it's going to be, yeah, it's it's going to be San Francisco 34, Kansas City 24. So I, I think they'll uh, run the clock quite a bit, keep the ball away, and they'll it, it, the score won't be as close as it seems. But that'll be uh, mark that one in your in your books there, Steve. Because I know you're into uh, it. Could be a Taylor Swift win. Yeah. It could be. It could, there's a lot of uh, background it's, stories. It's rigged. It's rigged. It's I'm surprised rigged. you're not going it's to the rigged. game. I heard the uh, heard the tickets are really cheap this year. <laughs> all week i say to mrs ice cap hey we can get this package for this amount or that How amount. Am, what are they going for again um uh, well you got to buy a package so then you can get in to see a lot of different things but you're for a hotel and you know seats you're in the stadium you're probably 25 usd for two Twenty-five thousand. so tw- yeah twenty five thousand usd for two tickets yeah, but you also get, you know, the official T-shirt and, and stuff. Or you can use the Looney Hour travel advice and go to Zermatt, you know, for the week <laughs> yeah. skiing yeah. for 100 bucks a day. I'd do that one. I would I would yeah. do the ski one myself. Careful. Wow. It's expensive to eat. It's cheap to ski. It's very expensive to eat here. Yeah. And drink. Oh. Eat bugs. bugs. Let's, let's get going. We got little bit of bugs, Rich. Eat bugs. <laughs> You're right there. I'm right Jesus. near Davos. I know. I should go to Davos. Give him a piece um, of mind. We've got, uh, yeah, you know, quite a bit going on here. We had uh, Powell did his famous 60-minute uh, speech there. We'll kind of unpack that. Some of the U.S. job numbers, which we were talking about last week, those came through. I think we got Canada's job numbers tomorrow. Lots going on in China, the commercial real estate market, Canadian housing. Um, you know, speaking of Canadian housing, we have... Uh, some of the sales numbers coming in. So if you look at sort of month over month, the sales uh, volume on a seasonally adjusted basis, th- those are really picking up. Uh, so like I said, a lot of hopium around rate cuts, which as we'll probably get into later in the show are maybe seemingly further out than I think the markets are hoping for. But, uh, you know, anecdotally here on the, here on the ground, um, seemingly every house that comes onto the market right now like in, in vancouver is coming with an offer date so things are things are busy right now um you know you don't set an offer date unless you're confident you can get multiple offers that's kind of what we're seeing in the housing market so if you're tiff macklem listening to this show uh housing is accelerating uh on the premise that they think you're going to cut rates so i have a question steve about that um, I know you would never do this, but can you explain when when real estate agents like spoof the bids? Is that what is that called when they like say that there's like loads of offers? I know you you of course would never do anything so nefarious like that. Uh, I mean, what is that called? I don't even know what you'd call that. Lying. You know what I'm saying, right? When they say like <laughs> they. Um... <laughs> Yes, in, in the investment world, we use fancy words, right? In yeah, the I world, mean, it's, uh, it's I will fancy. say this: there's a lot of there's a lot of guardrails now in place with regulations that you have to document every offer. You have to like submit that. Whoa, 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 every... whoa, 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 whoa! You're saying there's now regulations in the Canadian uh, housing apparently, industry? Man, these, these guys are really killing the party. Shut the barn door! I don't believe it. Okay. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm not. I'm not. Not totally crazy, right? When people say that there's like four offers in this building at a hundred, at a million dollars or whatever it is, and then oh, I mean, yeah, real. there's yeah, there's always there's always a few shady characters for sure. But I think with with a lot of the documentation that has to be done, at least in markets like Vancouver and Toronto, it's definitely harder to, to get away with that these days. But uh, unless yeah, you're from that, China. <laughs> well, speaking of, I don't know if anyone uh, did you guys follow the uh, the the hit piece there from Sam Cooper as well. I mean, I think this is, this should really make Canadians blood boil, right? I mean, like you're dealing with this like housing crisis. You know, you've got an entire generation that's been priced out of the housing market, and you know you're con- kind of competing with this this foreign wealth that's coming in, particularly from China in, in more recent years. And so there was a piece that Sam Cooper wrote, and uh, it was regarding HSBC, who of course was just acquired by RBC. Uh, but HSBC, you know, with with large banking connections there in Hong Kong, for example, has always been sort of one of those banks that 
you know, if you're a Chinese national, I mean, that's kind of where you put your money. And then one of the ways to get it over into Canada. So Sam Cooper basically wrote a piece um, about a whistleblower that worked inside HSBC. And essentially what was happening was they were basically faking. So, you know, for example, um, Someone from China would come here. They would be working as a uh, hairdresser in Canada, part-time hairdresser. And then they would be saying to HSBC, well, yeah, you know, I'm a part-time hairdresser here in Canada, but I uh, I work in Guangzhou and I make $536,000 as a business manager. So in terms of looking at foreign income, all of a sudden you qualify for, you know, a million and a half million, million and a half dollar mortgage. And then you start to, of course, inflate the property market through that mechanism. So a lot of stories about that. So in this particular case, you know, he highlights one lady who owned three homes in Aurora, Markham and Scarborough. <laughs> she worked part time as a hairdresser while claiming a $536,000 business manager job. And the list kind of goes on. There's some crazy examples in that story. So I highly encourage everybody to go check it out. But um, for all the uh, Canadian citizens working hard, paying their taxes and yeah, it's a uh, tough. Look. But what does it uh, allege that, you know, there it's, it's money being cleaned or, or laundered or. Yeah. Sort of there's like, there's some examples from the RCMP in there. Uh, some crime units saying, you know, they they kind of analyzed a lot of the files and said, this is kind of one ways to one way to sort of cleanse money. The other issue that you can bring up is that it is mortgage. I would argue it's mortgage income fraud, right? It's mortgage fraud. I mean, you, you can't just make up your job and say, I make $500,000. But the problem is, is like, you know, you think about it, like jobs, particularly in China, like those are, those are hard to verify. Yeah. If you're there's another, there's another, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, no, I was going to say the other angle that I think he mentions. I mean, um, Sam Cooper, for people who don't know, is a Canadian investigative journalist and he's written a book called Willful Blindness. And that book, um, basically, you know, it's, it's about, it's that, that book is about how criminal network of narcotics and, and drug dealers basically, um, you know, launder money through Canadian financial institutions and <laughs> the BC casino. Mm -hmm. um, Canada's a fantastic place to commit white collar crime and money launder, by the way, in case you're, I'm in Switzerland. How fitting anyways. Um, but the, he also alleges that it had an, all this money flowing through had an, a material impact on the house prices in the, the, the cities and, and, and provinces we've talked about, which is, British Columbia, Vancouver, so, Markham, and Toronto, and et cetera. One of the crazy things is, and and you know, the guest of the show here, Ron Butler's brought this up. I think he actually testified in Parliament more recently, um, lobbying for this and saying, you guys are like, this is so crazy. Is like in Canada. So when you submit like uh your your income, your income docs to the bank, um, you know, you submit your T4, for example, and you say, Okay, here's my income. What do I qualify for on a mortgage? That those were, there's a lot of stories out there that people are forging their income docs, right? So there's companies out there that will actually go out and they'll fabricate a T4 for you. And then, you know, that gets submitted to the bank. And it's crazy that in today's world of like technology and data that for whatever reason, Canadian banks have not linked up into CRA. Like, why can't you just say, hey, this is your income that you declared last year to CRA. It's all there. So why is that not like the bank should basically have like a direct access to say, okay, you're claiming you made $200,000 on your T4, but you submitted last year to CRA 120,000. Yeah. It should be pretty easy just to cross check that and say, is there, is this valid? But we don't have that in Canada for whatever reason in 2024. So there's a pretty easy solution for this. If we had a central bank digital currency, everything is linked <laughs> together and your no, social credit is it's true, Rich. They would I reconcile know, you're right. this. Yeah, they would reconcile it immediately. And hey, anyway, are you making jokes. a case for C B D C? He is. And he is he's well, gonna be about to get bumped off the loony hour. We're gonna find <laughs> another puppet to to parrot that stuff. 
did you call me a puppet or a parrot? Which one? <laughs> both. Or both. <laughs> but, but Steve, <laughs> Steve, the reason the banks didn't don't verify is because they know where their bread is buttered. That ultimately, I, I don't disagree. It's the right? easiest logical change. You're like, well, why does nobody actually implement this? Like, it's because they make money off of uh, issuing mortgages and totally. securitizing them, and away you go. But I mean, again, full, coming back full circle, I think that's the same case for HSBC. Like, everybody kind of like more or less turns a blind eye because everybody's compensated and the bank's making money. And you know, if the result is higher house prices, it benefits those that are already in there, and uh, everyone's that's getting right. wealthier. And you know, the forty percent of canadians that are shut out too bad and, and people it, just want to buy a home that's all they want <laughs> sam houses. cooper's amazing though people who aren't um, familiar with him should look i think he has a sub stack we'll give him a free plug hopefully we can get him on the show one day um, but, well, like one, one thing with hsbc i mean we've talked about it here before i mean they they are really the the, the u.s dollar conduit for china through hong kong that's that's the way it works mm -hmm. But they, uh, you know, they were caught red-handed laundry money for the Mexican cartels yeah. in the U.S. I'm going to say a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't know what the time frame was for it. And I mean, the, the irony with with all this is that, as an example, if an individual did it, and like if if it, you know, Joe Blow was laundering money for the Mexican cartel in the U.S., you know, he ends up in jail. You know, HSBC. You know, they neither confirm or deny the the charge. How, how do you how do you yeah, phrase that? I can, Rick? Neither, Something like, I can neither confirm or nor deny. Yeah, the allegation like that. Anyway, but they pay a fine, right? That's it, and they, yeah. they go on. And you know, it you know it just and you know all of a sudden we have this going on up here in our world, and you know it. In one way, it is what it is with the financial system. Like it cannot be perfect. It'll never be perfect. There's always going to be leaks and. You know, money, you know, flowing in and out to different cracks in, in the system. It's just getting highlighted here now because of the, you know, the challenge, this severe challenge we're having with, with housing. And, you know, it should be an extremely hot topic. And this is what maybe Ottawa should be really focused on instead of the other private bill that was floated this week, which... Whenever you're ready for that one, Steve, we'll we'll jump into it. But that'll be a good way to compare, like, hey, what what's important in Ottawa for some people and what isn't? Totally. So um, there was a new proposal out from an NDP. I'm well, gonna let Rich kind of chime in here, but basically, Rich, why don't you take it away? This is your bread and butter. Well, I mean, okay, so it was a private members bill. Um, from, if I'm not mistaken, the deputy N leader of the NDP, uh, Charlie Angus, he's a big deal in the NDP. I mean, I don't know what that means, but he's a it's not, M it's not MP. Wrong. <laughs> uh, he's a Canadian author, journalist, broadcaster, musician, and politician. That's what uh, his Wikipedia says anyways. But, uh, does he have a hammer and sickle on his LinkedIn page? <laughs> he may, he may, he may. Well, He's been a federal the bill is. member of parliament for the riding of Timmins, James Bay, since winning the 2004 election. Yeah, so, so they wanted to introduce um, Bill, I think he introduced Bill C-372, uh, I'm reading it right now, and it's called an Act Respecting Fossil Fuel Advertising. And you can go and just Google it if you want. It's on the you know Bank Parliament of Canada website. Um, and the preamble is about climate change, etc., and it's basically about it's an act. It's basically it's called the Fossil Fuel Advertising Act. Um, and it's you know it's it's about it is the opinion of fossil fuel advertising uh, advertising currently deploys techniques which knowingly mislead the public and fail to disclose the health and environmental harms associated with their use. Impen impending informed um, impeding informed consumer decision making. Blah 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 blah. And it's yeah. So it's, so that's it. But in that bill is um, something that Eric Nuttall, who's, um, you know, he competes, I guess, with with Keith for as a portfolio manager, but he's very, very specific went to energy. And and that's really his bread and butter rather than sort of a more different. Uh, yeah, more than a broader based investment manager. But anyway, so he said and this is literally Article eight. It says manner of promotion and prohibitive elements. It is prohibited for a person to promote a fossil fuel or the production of a fossil fuel. 
in a manner that states or suggested that a fossil fuel, its production, whatever, is less harmful than other fossil fuels. So think about how crazy that is. And then the thing is, and um, if, if this bill goes through, um, it would make it illegal to do such things and subject to two years in jail and a million dollar fine. So if we had an advertisement and we said that natural gas has 50% less emissions than coal, then I guess we would run afoul of this legislation. I mean, there's obviously a little bit more details, but that's the upshot of it. It's absolutely bonkers. Totally bonkers. And you don't even need a tinfoil hat to 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 snuff this one out. This is like all over the internet. It's been widely covered here by CBC, Global Mail, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, I'm two reading, years I'm in jail. reading it off no- the... I'm reading off the Parliament of Canada website. Sorry, I keep going. Sorry. Yeah, two million, two two years in jail, a million dollar fine for basically um, suggesting or promoting. Like for example, I think if you're saying, "Hey, listen, we've got this widely followed, you know, Canadian podcast, and you know, Rich is bestowing the benefits of fossil fuels, natural gas being a better source or a cleaner energy source than coal," um, that hypothetically under the bill that would be illegal and you could be sent to jail. So if anyone's looking for a, a spot in the loony hour, we got potentially one spot open up very, very soon. <laughs> I thought I was out as well. Oh, we're, you're right. That's right. We're, we're, we're both. both I'm a, yeah, I'm the puppet. We, uh, <laughs> we got another thing to talk about as well. Rich, you'll find some, up. some nice girlfriends in jail there, bud. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, hey, I'm, I'm open-minded. Listen, it's, this is absolutely totally nuts. Um, don't and drop I know the soap, a- Rich. Don't <laughs> drop your soap. Um, but it's 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 just it's 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 totally totally insane. It's I mean, arg- but again, anti science. I mean, if you genuinely do care about reducing emissions, that would be something that you would really care about. Um, it's I mean, so I mean, I get it. It's a private members bill, but it tells you sort of the views and attitudes of people and the priorities. I mean, that's what Keith mentioned earlier with the priorities of what instead of fighting systemic money laundering that is making housing unaffordable in Canada, they want to punish um, advertising of the most important commodity known to man. And, and then that's, it's fascinating in a kind of horrible way, Keith. I don't know. Commodity that has basically bestowed our current living standards. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I remember uh, last year or something, I found this, this piece on, I think it was on, Twitter or somewhere. I think it was in a small Italian town or village. And every year that they they'll take the the politician from the local area who they feel has been the least effective, that's to put it mildly, for the year. And they actually put them on this little floating raft that leaks and it, it, it floats out into the lake or pond or river. And tell and he's in a cage and it floats. Do you guys remember seeing that? I, I, you showed us. I think you've actually have already talked about it on the pod, but it's worth reminding. Yeah, I think now it. we have our candidate for this year. I'm, I, I nominate. You said he's been in Parliament since 2004? 2004, yeah. Man, that's a nice, that's a nice I mean, I think the bigger story here is like, I you know, like people are like, oh, you know, we should like stick out of the politics and stuff. I think the bigger story here is just like, the mismanagement of uh, some of these policymakers and where their thought processes are, right? Like we know like Canadians are dealing with, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis, a housing crisis. You've got rampant drug abuse and homelessness flooding, you know, these major metropolitan cities. And we've got so many issues. And and this is the one that sort of, this is where this guy's head is at. And, and, and I think it just kind of angles the whole anti, you know, energy sector and this is why i think you're seeing alberta sort of push harder and harder back against some of these sort of like extreme ideas and policies and you know we've talked about uh, mr gilbo being the most dangerous man in canada i mean it just the rhetoric coming from some of these individuals that are ultimately running this country and voted for by canadian citizens is is really a and, and that rhetoric, like he didn't come up with this overnight. Like this has been growing, festering, whatever word you want to use now for, for quite some time. And it, it, it is the culture that's there. Uh, what has me very concerned with something like this, like it's it's literally, remember that movie, The Minority Report? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great movie. Yeah, it, 
yeah, you know, you get arrested for something you're going to do in the future. Like this is this is a thought crime. And today, you know, it's well, if you believe that, you know, oil is not useful because the opposite of Rich's T-shirt, I, I think, something like that. Uh, you know, we want to put you in prison. If you disagree with the government, we're going to imprison you. We're going to cut off your your bank accounts and, and stuff. And and again, that it it is. I would suspect it's a slippery slope. This is it's very slippery, Steve. And it's going like you're at the top of the Matterhorn. You're almost ready to summit, and then you just whoa, you know, you you go down. But hopefully, the pendulum was will swing away. Can it can it get any more severe than this? You know, it, it can, of course. You know, with CBDCs, but uh, it, we continue to go closer. We're flying closer and closer to the sun, and we need someone to to stand up for this. That's not on the loony hour, but there's just um. So just to, just to wrap it up, like I think it's important. Like the fossil fuel industry funds our welfare state. Um, it it, it produces. 4%, 4.5% of a current account positive trade balance to our country that supplies hard currency. Um, that keeps our currency from going in the tank because we have no productivity growth. Although now with population growth, that actually probably helps the currency, but I digress. The point is, is that um, it's a real source of wealth and the NDP is ostensibly meant to be the defender of working class people. And this is a direct attack on their, their life, their livelihood. Um, and I think that that's sort of an indictment on on his party and where their priorities are. And in the interest of completeness, just to wrap this up, and I know we know we have lots of other stuff to talk about and move on. Article five of this bill, which I'm reading right now, says that I won't go to jail because it says this act does not apply in respect of a literary, dramatic, musical, cinematographer, blah, 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 or artistic work or production or performance, which I guess the loony hour falls into that category. So I'm safe for now, voice. There you go. Let's hope it does. That's Article Five, if in case you're interested. In. <laughs> but we had some, uh, you know, quite a bit of other like bigger picture news as well. We had uh, the highly discussed interview with Jay Powell on 60 Minutes. Everyone's kind of waiting for that. You know, I think that's so. His last 60 Minutes appearance, for those that maybe aren't paying attention, uh, the last 60 Minutes appearance, I think, was during the depths of the pandemic, and they basically said, you know what are you doing? And he's in, he's got that quote that went viral and he says, yes, we effectively are printing money. Uh, and so that still goes around like the whole Twitter sphere and everything. So this was, everyone's kind of leading up to this. Okay. What's he going to do? When's he going to cut rates? Um, so Keith, I know you watched the interview as well. What, uh, what was the kind of takeaway there? I didn't watch the interview. I assume it was on a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a Sunday night, right? I assume it's during the football. Did you actually, uh, I thought you game. watched it. I don't watch Womp Womp. <laughs> no, this is awkward. Well, I watched it. Uh, I watched the... what you think. <laughs> but I have a strong view on it. So uh... did you watch it, Rich? I'm skiing in it's Matterhorn. It's like 13 time. minutes. You guys had one job. I I we were, I was either there inebriated or trying not to die on a slope. <laughs> I mean, so basically they just kind of kept asking him, you know. When are you going to cut rates? When are you going to cut rates? And so I think like, some of the takeaways for me was like, you know, he's like, listen, we're not going to wait till CPI hits 2% to start easing. Um, you know, because then he's like, we'll be further behind the curve and da 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 da. But basically, yeah, I, you know, he came out and said, yeah, March is unlikely. But at some point, yeah, we do have to look to start easing. Um, and so, you know, I think he kind of pushed back a little bit as to like the timing of it. I think he, he acknowledged that there will be cuts in his opinion this year. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. But I mean, I think that interview was also recorded. Correct me if I'm wrong. That interview was actually recorded before the U.S. jobs numbers came out. Rich, I don't know if you want to walk us through those U.S. job numbers because they, it, it uh, was, they it was a banger pretty hot. It was a banger. It was a great number. I can't remember what it was expected, um, but the number, but non-farm payrolls rose by 353,000 in January. And that's very, very good. Um, and the unemployment rate remained at 3.7. Um, you had decent, I mean, wage growth is slowing, but it, from a very, very high number. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, among major, major work, worker groups, unemployment rate for men is 3.6%. Adult women, 3.2%. I mean, it's just, it was it was a it was a solid number. Professional business services seventy five thousand. 
um, you know, healthcare. And it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just the government, which, you know, in other points during this cycle, we've seen government really over have huge weight in that number, but things like manufacturing edged up, uh, 23,000. That's a very, very important number. Um, and the other one I was looking for was the construction because construction in industry is really important in the United States. They actually built homes there and I'm, I can't find it out, but it was also positive. There you go. That's, I don't know, Keith, you want to talk about the reaction to the market? Cause it was quite a significant one. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the sort of big thing with it is the previous month's number increased by 50%, almost look from 200,000 up to 300,000 plus. So like as, as an investment manager, when these numbers come out, you always have to notice the revision because that's what affects the, the current number. But the previous month got revised higher by a lot. And then the current number was two times the the initial estimate. The, the estimate was 180 and the real number was 360. So like it was uh, you know a, a banger number. The average hourly earnings was higher. Um, the number of hours was strong as well. Like there was nothing in this to be dovish. If you are a dove, uh, a bear, then you know there was a lot of uh, dis discussions taking place about part-time jobs was really increasing the number. And then the narrative with that is, you know, people have to take on extra part-time jobs just to make ends meet and. Yeah, you can reconcile it that way as well. But from an aggregate level, from you know, for the Fed, like this says, you know, we we don't have to cut rates at all, right? Maybe remember we started talking about that was it last week or the week before yep. that maybe the the surprise event for this year is that there were no rate cuts coming up, and then you know after that, of course, then on Monday morning we had the uh, the diffusion index came out. So we had the uh, American ISM data. And so again, this was the Monday morning after the Sunday night, 60 <laughs> minutes show. Um, so maybe this was a chance to the, the temper, the expectations. And and these numbers were really strong as well. So, you know, this, this American economy, the data points that everyone is hoping is going to roll over so that central banks will start to cut rates, uh, that narrative is if it's not playing out, it's getting delayed even further, which now bumps us. You know, we, you know, we're running headlong or headfirst into this like massive concrete election wall coming up for the Americans in November. So the so the Fed doesn't have a lot of meetings coming up where they can actually raise rates. And so right now the March meeting seems like, hey, that's off the table. So it, it's going to be a you know a, a tricksy little hobbit to try to, uh, to 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 fix this one coming up. Rich, you see any little hobbit houses there in uh, Zermatt? Um, we haven't seen any gnomes, is what I think you're looking for. The word you're looking for. <laughs> we have seen these tiny. No, little Lord houses. of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. There, there are hobbits. Yeah, but, uh, no, the, there's only gnomes in in the Alps. I think there's no hobbits in the Alps. It's no, the gnomes. Anyways, we did. There are some really cool houses. Like, what's wild is if you, you people are actually stupid enough to try to climb the Matterhorn, and like eighty five percent of the way up is a hut that like you is like the waypoint, and you like you get there and you like have a cup of coffee and I guess I don't know a stimulant but, of some kind, and then you climb it next day. But anyway, sorry, sorry, <laughs> that was crazy. Hey, geez, you guys are all over the map, but you just sit with. <sighs> We had this discussion last week on the podcast, which was like, listen, like the U.S. in terms of, you know, an economic shock or recession, it doesn't seem like that is going to come from the U.S. It's going to come from somewhere else. And so I think that just kind of reaffirms, you know, our views in the last uh, week or so, right? Which is U.S. jobs numbers came in, ISM came in hotter than expected. Uh, but then we kind of look across the globe, right? I mean, one of the ones that we flagged was was China. So Chinese equities um, got stomped again this week. Um, Keith, I don't know if you want to watch us walk us through that, but there's a, there's a lot going on over there as well. Uh, for for China, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah intervening mean... in the Chinese equity market. And, and I think they just replaced the uh, one of the regulators there, the guy that was in charge. Yeah, you know they they if the regulator is not producing the way they want them to. You know you're you're out, Rich. You're gone, and you know. <laughs> he's in jail with all the oil and gas guys. But, yeah, that's is right. there a, is there a national housing regulator in Canada? I guess there isn't, right? Or we would have 
well, promoted him right or there. whatever. Anyway, I know we're all over the map here, but you know, China. We've been talking about China for a while. I know they they have this in, in they're in this, you know, they're experiencing a debt crisis. And in a debt crisis, people have trouble paying off the debt. So not just households, but you know, these big, uh, you know, intergovernment provinces and agencies, and you know, one after the other. And it, it, it's sort of, you know, it, it's a big deflationary event because it clogs up your economy. Credit isn't flowing anymore, so you have that taking place. And uh, so, what's what's interesting right now, you know, so China, it it's a centrally planned economy which means the government in uh, out of Beijing, the CCP, they say, we're going to grow by this so much, we're going to hire this many people and, and all that stuff. Whereas everyone else in the world, it's you you set a policy and then you see what happens afterwards. You know, the result is the result as opposed to, you know, goal seek on, on your spreadsheet. So it's a century planned economy. They have this staggering debt loads. Uh, they have a closed capital account which means if you put your money in the country, you know, good luck getting it out unless you have a good friend at HSBC, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know what, they, they have a pegged currency. So the currency doesn't freely float in the market. People will say, oh, it does float. It's out of basket. But, you know, that's not true. They, they, they keep it very steady. And then their equity markets have been mullered you know, recently, they continue to go lower and lower. So the final thing you do with a centrally planned uh, economy and government, you say, hey, this got to stop. So you know, they've instructed banks and other entities to start buying stocks this week, you know, to support the, the stock market over there. Guys, th these aren't symptoms of a good, healthy economy. These are the signs, you know, that, you know, they're, they're grasping at straws to keep things together. And you know sometimes it works out. You you can do it, and but you need someone else to pull you out of it. Maybe it'll be the Americans. We, we'll see. But uh, none of this is positive news. Whenever you hear that the government is forcing people to buy stocks to stabilize the system, you know, that that's a sign that hey, capitalism doesn't exist. You know because you you leave, you're gone. So it's, it's it's serious. Oh. Sorry, Two of their sorry, largest sorry. property developers are basically insolvent. I mean, that's yeah. uh, usually never a good sign. But um, we also had this week, uh, so China CPI. So we've been talking about, you know, hey, sticky inflation here in the U.S., Canada, what are the central banks going to do? I mean, that's certainly not the problem in, in China, the world's second largest economy. Uh, inflation, CPI inflation fell to its lowest levels uh, since 2009. So they actually have, they actually have technically right now, they have outright deflation. So CPI uh, fell 0.8%, negative 0.8% on a year-over-year -year basis in January. Uh, so they do have outright deflation happening and producer price indices uh, as well, uh, down 2.5% year-over-year. So there's just one more thing on China. Um, so there's been, um, China used to be a huge um, net recipient of FDI, uh, foreign direct investment. Um, it used to attract almost 2% of GDP. That's an incredible number. Um, for the first time in a long time, they now have a net outflow of money. So yes, they have a closed capital account, but their money does leave in certain, you know, and also you have, it's a net FDI number, right? So um, it's sort of the balance of inflows and outflows. And what that's basically saying is there's Chinese companies that want to invest in, you know, Indonesia or Vietnam or wherever. And th but there are fewer and fewer companies that want to invest there. And so that outflow um, is one of the reasons. I mean, if you have a portfolio flows, you have um, direct investment flows and there's other types of flows. But that's one of the reasons that the stock market is not doing well is that people, what did you say, Keith? It's return of capital rather than return um, in, in capital or return on, on capital. capital. And so that's, and so there's like, um, until that gets sorted, I think, um, you know, in the FT yesterday, it said, you know, there was increased uh, buying by Beijing's national team. I thought you guys would like that of state run institutions. And you can do that for a while. But anyways, Steve, sorry, I just thought it was interesting that important to point that there was after decades and decades of, of foreign inflows into China, you're finally having net, net foreign outflows. And that's a big deal for, for that economy. Does that so with, um, go ahead, Keith? Yeah, so I mean, I know you know we're we're you know we're Canadian focused and centric, and two of us are based in Canada most of the time. <laughs> but uh, again, we bring up these you know global observations with you know because we want to share with everyone here in Canada that 
what happens outside of Canada potentially has the higher probability of impacting us, you know, domestically and, in, and locally. So again, we're not trying to, hey, jump to the most interesting story, what sounds great and what doesn't or anything. If the Chinese economy and financial system does have a re-escalation of risk or a crisis that starts to snowball out of control, uh, it, it will absolutely affect us here in Canada. So, so that's why we're we're bringing this up because I know we talk about hey, you know, risk has been synchronized over the years and stuff like that. And you know, I, I continue to believe that Europe might be the the market that you know it maybe that's the trigger point for something. But now it's increasingly looking like maybe yeah, maybe it is China. We'll see. But the one uh, extraordinarily positive trend and development we have it is what's happening with the americans you know the, the data there it, it it hasn't gotten bad at all like it, it is it's still strong so i just want to share that steve before we yeah that's over. a good point I mean, i'm just trying to think this through like you feel like if you're like a chinese citizen that's fairly well off that you'd be kind of in a somewhat of a panic to get your money out of the country no, because you would have done it as soon as you had the opportunity 10 years ago when you made the money. No, I'm teasing. I mean, I think you're right. The answer, the short answer is right is yes. I think that it's rather sensible, I think, to have a diverse, just a diversified portfolio. I think wealthy people in China, in China have been allocating, have been pulling money out of that country for years and years and years. I mean, Sydney, Australia is a classic example. Um, Hong Kong, before they really put their teeth into it, is another example. Um, all over the world, I mean... Um, and, and and that's why, for example, just for the, you know, when we bring it back to Canada, why insisting that our pension funds only invest in Canada is a stupid idea. You want to have sort of that, um, those shock absorbers from outside of, um, outside of your jurisdiction. Do you, do you also feel like from a inflationary perspective that, you know, the second largest economy is going through this deflation event? And potentially Europe, I know Keith, you flagged that as like, hey, look, these guys are still kind of screwed. Like, does that economy get into sort of a deflationary environment once again? And then you've got two pretty large major players that are really, you know, disinflationary, deflationary. Does it is that like is that almost the the bailout lever for the Fed and for guys like Tiff Macklin with the BOC, which is like you get some help from the outside because right now I don't, there's a, I, to, to, you know, as we've discussed, I don't think there's a whole lot of air cover right now to be cutting rates in Canada and the U S like. Yeah. I mean, so the, so, you know, in, in the West, or should say Canada and, and the U S, you know, we still have this inflation problem, you know, that we all talk about uh, a deflationary problem is created when you have the a bursting of a debt bubble. So when someone can't pay back their loans, um, and remember one person's loan is another person's asset. So let, let's just get extreme. Let's say all the bonds in the world go to zero. And people would say, hey, that means there's no debt anymore. It's great. But you know, pension funds lose 30% of their assets. Your balanced mutual fund has just lost 40% of its assets and, and stuff like that. So if we do get a deflationary bust, and it is coming from China, um, you know, that that creates deflation in China, but they export that to the rest of the world. So it's it will help with inflation over here, but it's not the way you want inflation to be resolved over here. You just want inflation to be resolved slowly and, and gradually. Because if if China does go boom in, in the middle of the night, um, it's going to create some some pretty big problems, you know, beyond that. Well, yeah, I don't I think, think it's an excellent like question. An easy way oh. out. So I just want to give you credit, Steve. I think that's an excellent question. Honestly, I think that's probably on the front of minds of lots of policymakers and bankers, and it should be on the mind of a lot of portfolio managers. I would just say that the inflation you're seeing in Canada, not I get I we really are beating a dead horse at this point. So I apologize for our regular listeners and thank you for staying tuned in. Is a function of the population growth and rents. Um, whereas China exports deflation in the form of consumer goods which we know has come down um, commodity prices there. They consume, you know, 40, 50% of all of the commodities you can think of, maybe not oil, but you know what I mean? Copper and iron ore and blah, blah, blah. So there's like, there's pockets where China's disinflation or deflation would be quite acute. And that would trickle into Canada. 
but we've shared the CPI numbers and that's not necessarily what's happening here. And in the US, I would argue it's the same thing. And so you have those sort of two forces playing off one another. But I think it's an excellent question. I, I don't know. Well, have yeah, I mean, the it. other <laughs> the other issue, Keith, you know, as you said, the uh, sort of debt deflation, you know, people not being able to repay their debts. Um, you know, we're seeing that now it's becoming a larger story in commercial real estate, particularly in the office space. Um, and so we've had some issues at some some U.S. banks that's been emanating over into Japan. Um, now there's a lot of circulation around the commercial real estate crisis now unfolding across Europe as well. Um, Keith, I know you've been following that story fairly closely, but do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, I think we, we first we didn't break the story. We shared the story uh, about the New York bank, you know, that experienced the, uh, the the challenge. And they're still experiencing challenges, like deposits are just flying out the door. And then we share that, hey, this is now being experienced in Japan as well, because, you know, they, they have on their, their investment portfolio investments in U.S. commercial um, mortgage-backed securities, I guess, or REITs as well, they would be in. And then this week, one of the German banks, they've announced they have the same kind of exposure. What one of my uh, friends, he's a European based manager, and uh, he actually shared with a little chat group that, that I'm in that uh, he bought a German REIT uh, a, a while back. He's thinking, hey, this is great value. He said it's now down seventy percent, you know, since he bought it. So it, again, it, is this now a trend that can spread elsewhere? Um, you know, one, one place doesn't start a trend, it spreads to Japan, maybe a trend is starting the third place, then I think you can clearly say, okay, is there a fourth place? And if there is, then it can start to get very serious. There were a lot of articles this week about it. Uh, a lot of them were suggesting one of the Canadian banks will have exposure to this. We're not going to mention which one, but uh, Canada is, is you know, popping up in this story. So let's see if there is a fourth bank or pension arm or someone that that's, has exposure to it. Because it, again, you know, we, we've had this, because of the COVID policy responses, it, it really changed the way that people physically work, where they go and things like that. And it seems like assets everywhere have been allocated to the real estate market and, you know, these big new shiny buildings and then the older buildings are not as shiny. And, Hey, now they're they're coming out in value and like losses are, are losses. So let let's keep our eye open, see how this develops. But this could be, you know, a, a pretty significant event. So Rich, get home as soon as possible before uh, this breaks. Soon. We I, did I, have I, uh, so Jay go. Powell in his sixty minute interview. He actually did comment on the uh, commercial real estate because they asked him about that, and you know, he said in his words he felt it was quote manageable, uh, but that some uh, some institutions would would go under and they would have to sort of. Uh, you know, uh, amalgamate their assets, basically. Uh, we also had Osvi's uh, Peter Rutledge today uh, on the Canadian banks. And so he says, my intuition is that we'll come through this commercial real estate office, commercial real estate problem pretty well, not without loss, just everything's relative. And I think relatively, we'll be okay on that. So, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't exude a whole ton of confidence there. Um, you know, clearly there's definitely some concern. Um, so in terms of uh, exposure from the Canadian bank's perspective, uh, there's a recent analysis here on the Canada's six largest banks. Uh, National Bank of Canada has no exposure and the Bank of Nova Scotia has minimal lending in the segment. Other major banks like CIBC, BMO, Royal Bank, and TD have more significant stakes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I think it's still, I think it's like even with those larger banks there, I think it's still less than three or four percent of their total secured lending book. So um, in Canada, you'd think it's still relatively small, but um, yeah. But the challenge but is, you just can't look at it from a, a, a single factor perspective because everything is is multi layered, mm -hmm. and again, everyone's on edge these days, right? Whether those who are not on edge, they're just uninformed. Yet, or maybe <laughs> those who are on edge, maybe they're too informed, right? Maybe they're watching too many podcasts and things. But like the the risk, like with this New York bank, it, as soon as it became known that hey, they have a challenge here, like deposits leave the bank, and because they're levered, you know, for every you know million dollars in deposits that came out, that's like a ten to ten to one leverage ratio for the, for the bank. 
And so whenever I hear, yeah, the exposure is only this or that, or like another great, a great comment I hear all the time, whenever there's a problem in the emerging market world, you know, say it's Thailand or something like that, you know, and so one of the analysts will come out and go, oh yeah, but such and such Canadian bank, they have no exposure to that market and they only have a 3% exposure to Malaysia and th this is a non-event, you know, that that's kind of, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, money is, it's fluid, it's liquid, it moves around, but not only will it move around, it runs away from trouble, right? That's, that's the way it, it, it works. So, hey, let's, let's see where it goes, if it goes further. No, I think if you're a Canadian bank, though, just to add to that point, right? So you're like, okay, well, you know, the office space is, you know, relatively small in the, in the bigger picture. However, there could be some contagion there. I mean, I think they're going to have some soured loans from the, the development side as well. Uh, so, so that, you know, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean, Canadian developers, I mean, let's be honest. I'm As we talked about at the beginning of the show, uh, I would like to emphasize that while we're seeing a resurgence or a, a it's definitely a bounce back in the residential resale market, you, you can't paint the entire picture with a broad brush. So where we're seeing issues, you're still seeing a lot of issues in the pre-sale market. So think about developers, you're still seeing a lot of inability to get projects off the ground. Um, and so there's still a lot of problems there. So while the resale market's kind of out doing its own thing, there's still a lot of problems in the Canadian housing space. And and obviously the banks are, are tied into a lot of those loans. And so I just want to read a, a quote from the Bundesbank. So the uh, Bundesbank is the Germans' central bank. Um, pretty good one, I think. Um, they Until they kicked out Jens Weidmann, <laughs> who was like an arch hawk and didn't want to support the Greek bailout. But anyway, that's a conversation for a different day. Um, he they said the uh, to, to Keith's point said the outstanding volume of loans granted by the German banking system to the U.S. commercial real estate is comparatively small, but relatively concentrated at individual banks, and that's probably an accurate statement. But as Keith, you know, eloquently said, it, it misses the trick. It's like if that one if one bank has loads and loads and loads of U.S. real commercial real estate loans goes bust, well, they have you know, that's, they're connected to other banks. And we saw this um, in the 2008 housing crisis, um, where all these different companies are sort of linked together. And I'm not comparing those two events, but you know, there are certain similarities. And, um, or I guess I am comparing those two events, but they are different. But the, you know, those similarities do exist. And that I just thought it was classic central banker comment, Keith, that basically uh, typify what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, another way to watch this now, what I'm looking at, you want to look for action in the repo market. So if, if I mean, the street, you know, like the industry, you know, you, they, they know very quickly if someone is in trouble or not. And if they are, you don't want to lend, you don't want to play with them. You know, you stay away. So if, if you, if no one's willing to play with you, you know, to lend you money overnight or to take your deposit overnight, or if they do take your deposit, you're not going to pay them very much, you know, because you got them, you know, they're in trouble. Uh but another way to watch this, if it develops further, is to watch the repo world or other kind of liquidity markets. And then you're going to be able to see that, hey, yeah, there's now a risk here in, in this system. So we're not there yet, but uh, these are all little, you know, uh, clues and, and hey, secrets. Speaking that of that, there's been um, so there's a little bit of, a bit of discussion in the last week or two about the Bank of Canada sort of intervening. Um. And so there was some commentary about um, Scotia Bank as well came out and talked about um, basically what's happening is the Bank of Canada has been injecting liquidity. Uh, so there's been um, an upward drift in Cora, which is the overnight repo rate basically in Canada. I don't know if you've been following that story at all, Keith. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, initially it didn't seem like it was it was too much compared to what's been happening before. But I've been looking, you know, increasingly into this. And, you know, at the end of the day, it represents there's a, a lack or declining availability of uh, acceptable collateral in, in the system. And that that's what's happening. And and again, this is another sign that this is going in the wrong direction. In the wrong direction, it's, you know, things are getting tighter and tighter like that. So I, I know a lot of people have pointed this out and, and they are correct to point it out. And then no, it's another one of these clues that we'll continue to watch. But it, it's it's an important factor again 
you know, for our economy. Maybe we'll have some jobs being uh, created on Friday. As a reminder, what's today? For Steve, Thursday. anyway, Rich, today's Thursday, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. So by the time you're listening or watching this on Friday, the Canadian jobs number has already come out. So we'll, uh, or Steve calls it the random number generator. Well, hey, let's see the random number generator. Speaking of uh, jobs, so we had Bell Canada, which is, uh, you know, pretty large telecom there, slashing, uh, coming out and announcing that they're cutting 4,800 jobs, 4,800 jobs uh, across the company, which is one of their largest, uh, I don't know if I call it a restructuring, but largest job layoff announcements uh, in, in recent history. So kind of wait, wait, on, think- on that. Yeah, oh, sorry. Ahead. No, I was going to say on that, uh, for those pay- paying attention at home, uh, remember how Rogers absorbed Shaw? They cut uh, 1,300 jobs for restructuring. And now Bell Canada is cutting jobs. Remember, everybody, this is an ol- oligopoly that massively over earns. And how do I know that they over earn? Because if you compare their return on equity versus companies of comparable size in the same industry, in other developed uh, rich world markets, they have, I don't know, 50, 70% higher return on equity. We get charged the highest mobile phone rates in the world. And lo and behold, they're consolidating their business and uh, cutting employees and I can, and they're raising their prices. Remember that they, they raised their prices a little while ago. And so the oligopoly money train keeps on ticking. Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't help but, but add that. I feel like we yeah, still continue to see a lot of these media headlines commenting and, and, and noting all these job cuts. It seems like, you know, the earnings numbers come out, you know, they do okay. And then immediately after that, we're cutting jobs. Well, I mean, one way, you, I mean, one way you can improve your net income is by cutting your costs and what is the largest cost for most companies um employment or labor right well I, I mean i agree with that i just think it's, it's, so. it's not necessarily symbolic of incredibly robust economy is it no i don't think so no um but again there's difference between canada and the us and i think also there's differences in these types of companies i mean you could make the case that if you're an oligopoly and you have your consumers buy the short and curlies you don't need to invest in infrastructure because you have no competition um why hire people to sell mobile phone plans or whatever just cut down your workforce provide shit service charge a lot of for it and then contribute to whichever political party will allow you to maintain the status quo i mean Maybe we should, I think we should be careful about each industry and how they react and what sort of their incentives are. But I think in general, I think you're making a fair point. I definitely think Rich is going to lose access to his mobile data plant when he comes back to the country. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But there is yeah. a bit, you know, it is something that's hard to reconcile, Steve. You, you are right. You know, earnings are still great. A lot of companies, um, you know, the, the top down employment data is, suggests, hey, things are things are OK, you know. Uh, yet the bottom up, every company now, you know, they're announcing layoffs, you know, re- restructuring. So Citigroup, they're reducing their London wealth office team by 10%. And McKinsey, you know, one of the big global consultants, they're cutting 3,000 staffers, they call it. So it, it, again, like I'm not seeing these, hey, there are people are hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring. It's, I think it's, as as one company starts to cut... It, and it's you see how it's received in the marketplace, like with stock prices and, and things like that. Um, if it's well received, then all of a sudden everyone else will say, "Hey, I'm going to do the same thing." You know, let, let's cut the dead weight, and uh, you know, well, we, we keep going. Well, I think one of the bigger ones too this week wasn't on uh, was Tesla. Uh, so there wasn't an official like job cut, uh, but there was an internal memo apparently going around uh, asking which jobs are deemed critical. Um, and to affirm whether each employee's position, yeah. To affir- so it seems, you know, the stock's down like to what, 25, 26% this year. Uh, yes. EV sales, as we know, are slowing uh, across all companies. And uh, so it looks like Tesla, the stock market darling, is uh, potentially looks like they're going to be slashing jobs here in the near future. Mm-hmm. 
There you go. Mm-hmm. Strong economy. Everything's fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. But hey, the numbers the numbers keep coming out all right. So yeah, I think we had think... initial jobless claims today too from the U.S. Oh those, yeah, something just those... something to watch going forward. I know we're wrapping up here, but something to watch going forward is um, multiple job holders, which I think is something that uh, was flagged a little while ago. So if you you know you can there's some great data that's for free, and if you just Google Fred. Um, which is the St. Louis Fed, and they have a brilliant um website with charts and stuff. And they do it's not there's they have all the job data and whatever, and they have uh, multiple job holders as a percentage of total people employed. Um, and the 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 thinking behind you know the emphasis on that and focus on that and the worries about that is that if you're gainfully employed at one job and and you're meeting all your your making ends meet, you know to the best of your ability, etc. Um, then everything's going great. But if you start to take on more and another job, you know, means that you're under some kind of financial stress, I guess, um, is sort of the thinking behind that. And we can see that that multiple job holders number is now back up to sort of the highs of the last you know, 20, 30 years. Um, it's been higher, obviously, at, you know, in 2008 and in, in the 90s and stuff, it was it was it was around six and a half percent. But we're now at like, you know, a cyclical high, which is starting to worry some people about the underlying strength of the economy. Keith, is there one thing that to kind of wrap this up that you look at, like all the the sort of news and stories and narratives that are out there? Is there one thing that you look at in particular and say, hmm, like this is this is the thing to watch. Yeah. So we, we always try to separate the current narrative with markets because they can go two different directions. You know, the narrative might be amazing and, and markets are in the gutter and then, you know, you have the opposite taking place. So right now there's plenty of reasons to be concerned about the world and, and markets. Um, but yet when you look at, I mean, just talk about equity markets. That's what everyone tends to gravitate towards. You know, they're hitting new highs again here right now. Uh, a lot of the sort of models and data points we look at though, for broad equity markets, so it, it's, it's pretty toppy right now. Like this isn't a place where you'd want to get aggressive, you know, and adding to the market because it is such suggesting, you know, we have two outcomes coming up, you know, where market will trade sideways to choppy for a few months or we get a you know a, a pretty nice correction here sort of flush out you know the weak hands and then then you start again but that's what we're looking at right now and then the other part of the world that uh you know we, we think we think if you're not considering this outcome and then you're you know you're sort of neglecting you know your role as an investment manager and that is the potential for oil just to you wake up some night, some morning, sorry, and it, it's at 100 or 125 or, or 150. Because if, you know, something crazy happened in the Middle East, you know, it, if that doesn't happen, oil can easily, you know, go down the $60 range, maybe, you know, with weaker demand and everything. But I, I think everyone, you need a plan in place for these potential outcomes where the probability is probably a lot higher than normal but these are the things that are jumping out at us i mean it's uh, again this is a big election year for a lot of countries a lot of markets and obviously the american one is, is the biggest one coming up with uh in november rich yeah for me i think it's what we discussed a little while ago um and you sort of alluded to it um and it's 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 sort of i think it's inflation um, remember one thing we taught, we, we kind of skipped over when we were talking about the jobs market and we talking about the strength and robustness of the U S economy is that deficit spending is insane. Last year, I think it was 8.4%. I think it's dropped to 6.4% of GDP. That's an incredible amount of money, money printing, you could argue that that's, and you're doing that when your economy is effectively at full employment. And so, you know, until that changes, um, and make no mistake, by the way, it doesn't matter who's in power. I, I don't think Donald Trump's going to run a, bu- a balanced budget. <laughs> um, but anyway, my point is at full employment, running those deficits with the constraints that you have in the market, I think inflation is something that people aren't paying attention. That's something I'm, I've got really got my eye on. I could be wrong, but I think we're going to see it to carry higher. 
There you go. I think it's a good place to end it. Uh, keep an eye out for tomorrow, Friday, Canada's <laughs> random number generator. Uh, that will be a key key indicator here for uh, Tiff Macklem at his next meeting. So we'll be watching those numbers. But as always, we'll see you next week.